Hello. Today we'll talk about the adjoint of a linear operator. This will be the first in a two-part series. Before we begin, let's review some of the concepts from the previous lesson. We'll start with the motivating example. Say that we have the standard inner product on the real plane R2. Recall that we have lots of orthonormal bases we can choose from. Here we have an example in terms of two row numbers A and B, not both zero. We've seen before that we can express any vector, lowercase b, as a linear combination of elements from the spaces. In particular, we can write any vector in terms of the inner product of v and u1 times the vector u1 plus the inner product of v and u2 times the vector u2. Well, let's denote v perp as the first part, the inner product of v and u1 times the vector u1. You see this here to the left of your screen. Similarly, we can consider v parallel, which we define as the scalar, the inner product v times v and u2 times the vector u sub 2. This is on the right-hand part of your screen. There is a rather simple geometric interpretation of all of this. To explain what it is, let's let w be the line spanned by the vector u1. This is just the line ax plus by equals 0. We can also consider the perpendicular line w perp, that is the line w rotated by 90 degrees. This is just the set of points xy such that bx minus ay equals 0. We can use this to define a linear transformation that's just projection on to this line. Here's a diagram. We'll have our vector v, which is the blue line, and we'd like to project on to the line w, which is the solid black line you see towards the bottom of this diagram. If v is the blue point, the blue vector, then periwinkle is v parallel. Again, this will be the projection onto the line w. Red will denote v perp. This will be everything that's at 90 degrees to our line w. We'll observe that with this projection map, the image is just the line w, while the null space is the orthogonal complement w perp. In fact, we can put all of this together to see that the length of the red arrow is just the closest that a point v can get to this line ax plus by equals zero. We use all of this to make a definition. Say that v is a vector space either over the real numbers or the complex numbers, and let's fix an inner product. Given a subset S of V, we define this orthogonal complement as the set of vectors in V such that the inner product of X and Y is zero for all Y in the subset S. We denote this set here in terms of this symbol and read it as S perp for S perpendicular. We have a few results. Let's say that W is a finite dimensional subspace of our vector space V then w perp is a subspace of v. The intersection of w and w perp just consists of one point, namely the origin. For every y in our vector space v, there are unique vectors u in our subspace w and z in the orthogonal complement w perp, such that y equals u plus z. Moreover, the vector u in our subspace w is the closest vector in w to our vector y. Finally, if v is finite dimensional, then the dimension of w plus the dimension of w perp is equal to the dimension of v. Today we're going to talk about the adjoint of a linear transformation. We have one main result. As always, say that v is a vector space over either the real numbers or the complex numbers, and let's fix an inner product. For every vector y in v, let's let g be that map that takes a vector x to the inner product of x and y. Then g is a linear transformation. Conversely, let's say that g is a linear transformation from v to our field f then there exists a unique y in our vector space v since the g of x is equal to the inner product of x and y for every x in the domain v. Second, let t be a linear transformation from v to v. 
then there exists a unique linear transformation, T superscript star from V to V, such that the inner product of T of X and Y is equal to the inner product of X and T star of Y for all X and Y in V. There's a couple of different ways to think of what this proposition says. The first part states that linear transformations from V to the scalars F are in one-to-one -one correspondence with vectors in V. Second, let's let T be any linear transformation. Then the linear transformation from the second part of the theorem is called the adjoint of T. The funny symbol expressed in the theorem is read as T star. Let's give an example of what's going on here. Say that V is C2, and let's consider the standard inner product, defined as you see here on your screen. Let's consider a linear transformation T from V to V, defined as follows. T is simply multiplication by some two by two matrix A, B, C, D. Now we can consider the inner product of Tx and Y. You can see here that we can move around the parentheses a little bit so that instead of writing everything as something times y1 conjugate plus something times y2 conjugate, we can express this as x1 times something plus x2 times something. The idea is that we've pulled out x1 and x2 and we have some terms left over. This will help to motivate where the adjoint is coming from. Similarly, let's say that we have a linear transformation u from v to v, defined as you see here on your screen. u now comes about by multiplication by the matrix a conjugate, c conjugate, b conjugate, d conjugate. Again, we can consider the inner product of x and u of y. Notice that we can write this as x times something plus x2 times something. Putting all of this together, we see that the adjoint of T is what we're calling here our linear transformation U. Again, the idea is that we could kind of write everything in terms of X1 and X2, and seeing what's left over allows us to figure out what the adjoint is. In particular, we can really see how this works out with matrices. The adjoint of the matrix A, B, C, D here is what we've defined as the adjoint of a matrix before. It is the transpose of the complex conjugate of the matrix. This we'll call, come back to and discuss a bit more in the next lesson. Let's discuss the proof of this theorem. We'll start by for, showing the first statement. First, let's fix a vector y in our vector space v, and let's define a map g from the vector space to the scalars by g of x equals the inner product of x with y. We'd like to show that this g is a linear transformation. We'll show that g preserves linear combinations. To this end, let's say that x is a linear combination of vectors x, i, and v. Then, by definition, g of x is the inner product of x with y. Now we'll substitute in x is our linear combination of the x sub i's. But the inner product is linear, so we can write this as a sum of inner products xi with y. But by definition, the inner product of xi with y is g of xi. So now we see that g of x is a linear combination of the g of xi's, so by definition, g is indeed a linear transformation. Conversely, let's say that g going from our vector space v to the scalars f is a linear transformation. We're going to show that there exists a unique vector y says that g of x is the inner product of x with y. Uniqueness means that we have to show two parts. First, there is at least one y, and second, there is at most one y. Let's first show that there exists at least one such y. Let's fix an orthonormal basis beta for v. Then we know that we can express x as a linear combination of elements in this basis, but in particular, the scalars of such linear combination can be expressed explicitly in terms of inner products. With this in mind, let's choose y as the sum of, is the linear combination of the u sub j's, but the scalars now will choose to be the complex conjugate of g of u sub j. 
Putting this together, let's consider the difference of the inner product of x with y and g of x. First, we'll substitute in the expression we have above for x. This allows us to have now a difference of various sums. Second, we'll substitute in our expression for y. Once we have both of these, we now observe that the inner product of ui and uj is either 0 or 1, so this simplifies into a sum minus a similar sum, but of course these cancel to 0, thereby showing that g of x does indeed equal to the inner product of x with y. Let's now talk about the other direction. Why does there exist at most one such y? Well, let's say that perhaps there are two. That is, let's say the g of x equals the inner product of x and y, and maybe equals the inner product of x and y prime for two different y and y prime. Let's now choose x to be y minus y prime. Again, this expression holds for all x, so we'll choose one specific x here. A quick identity shows that the square of the norm of x must be 0, but the norm is a non-degenerate function, so we see that x has to be the 0 vector, showing that y equals y prime. That is, there is at most one such y. Now let's show the second statement. We need to actually explain where the adjoint is coming from. Let's define t star by the relations you see here on your screen. That is, for all x and y and v, we'll define t star as that function such that the inner product of t of x and y is equal to the inner product of x and t star of y. First, let's show that t star is well defined. Let's fix any y in our vector space v. We know that the map g going from our vector space v to the scalars f defined by g of x in terms of the inner product of t of x and y is a linear transformation. Here's why. Let's say that x is a linear combination of some x sub i's. Then g of x is t of x and y, but now we'll substitute in x as a linear combination of the x sub i's. We realize that t is a linear combination, so this is a sum of the t of x sub i's, but the inner product is linear, so this is a sum of the inner product of the t of x sub i's and y. But these inner products are just equal to the g of x sub i's, so we see that g of x is a linear combination of the g of x sub i's. That is, g takes linear combinations to linear combinations, so it must be a linear transformation. Our previous result says that if we have a linear transformation from v to the scalars f, then there must exist a unique z such that g of x is equal to the inner product of x and z. This is the proposition we just proved. We'll define t star of y as this vector z. Then, from the way that we've set up our notation, the inner product of t of x and y is equal to the inner product of x and z, which of course is equal to the inner product of x and t star of y. Now we have to show that our t star, our adjoint, is indeed a linear transformation. Let's now say that y is a linear combination of some y sub i's. Let's consider a map g sub i defined by g sub i of x is equal to the inner product of t of x and y sub i. As we just worked out, g sub i is a linear transformation, so there exists a unique z sub i such that g sub i of x is equal to the inner product of x and z sub i. Now let's consider the linear, the inner product of x and t star of y. Well, here, we know from the way that we've set up our notation, this is equal to the inner product of t of x and y. Now we'll substitute in y is a linear combination of the y sub i's. We see now that we have a linear combination of the x and z i, the inner product of x and z i but we can express this by looking at the inner product of x and a sum of the z sub i's. Now, remember that the z sub i's are just t star of y sub i's. This is the way that we define t star of y sub i's. So if we stare at this, we now see that we have an inner product of x and a sum of t star of y sub i's. 
Of course, we really would like to prove that t star of y is equal to the sum of the t star of y sub i's. That would show that t star preserves linear combinations. To this end, let's denote x as the difference of these two. That is t star of y minus this sum of the t star of y sub i's. Since the expression above in terms of the inner products holds for all x, we'll choose this specific x. Then it's easy to see that the square of the norm of this vector x must be zero. And since our norm is non-degenerate, we see that x here must be the zero vector. That is, t star of y must be a linear combination of the t star of y i's, showing that t star is indeed a linear transformation. And this completes the proof. Thanks very much for watching.